it made me go places that I, I didn't necessarily want to go. What do you do when life hits you hard and you're lying on the floor staring at the ceiling? I spent 42 days laying on a bed beside her crib. I withdrew from everyone. How do you find hope in the darkest moments? My decision was going to affect four other people. I stood there and I thought, am I worth it? Like, that was the biggest moment, the biggest question. Changing the way we talk to ourselves can be the first step to overcoming our biggest challenges. I used to write that I felt broken. I've changed that and I feel like it was the moment I actually got brave. What's the key to transforming your life from the inside out? It's been crazy where I am now. I have practiced getting up again and again. If I'm not challenging myself, I'm not growing. Jody Barrett, a mother, a friend, an author, an impact maker. It resonates with me in what I do now because I believe people need hope. The Life Edge mission is to help people learn, grow, and succeed by discovering their edge in life, the thing that makes them unique. What would you say has been your edge in life? Hmm. I read that just before I came on here. I'm like, okay, you're going to sound smart and intelligent on what? <laughs> Throw that out the window. <laughs> no, um, I love that. And actually, the thing that came to mind to me right away when I read that and you asked that is... I did a mobility retreat in the state, uh, in Mexico, with um, a nonprofit, SUPVET, so they're military, they're inactive and active duty uh, veterans. And this will relate because the guy said to me his thing that he always talked about was find your ball. He said it over and over the seven days we were there. Life's about finding your ball. And I remember he said to me, and it makes me goosebumps thinking about it because he looked at me one day and he says, you found your ball, Jody. And so for me, it was like, my ball was my vehicle that I've used to share. And it was initially, it's the kettlebell. And that's how we got connected, right? Mm -hmm. But the kettlebell is my vehicle to help share through mindset and movement. And it's allowed me to share my story on a platform I didn't even know existed and connect with people like the connection I've made the past 10, like seven, I guess I've been at this just about eight years now with the kettlebell training is, it's been incredible. The stories and being able to share my story actually through my book too was one of the most incredible parts there was not me sharing, but what I got back from people where they would open up and share stories of stuff mm -hmm. that they've held in. So I feel like maybe my life's edge is being able to actually share my story to connect because there's such a power in connection. I would love to dive a bit into your story. Throughout your story, your mindset, your inner dialogue, the things, the struggles you went through, um, I would just love to break down where you were at and what your mindset was because getting to know you, having conversations with you, you're, you are an amazing woman. You're always smiling. You're always laughing. And it's when you read your story, it's hard to think like that you could be so joyous and so happy because for what <laughs> you went through, just one of the things that you went through, I, I think of like myself today or just the the, the people of today, like that would break so many people. <laughs> one thing that you went through. So why don't you go ahead and t take us back to the beginning and share your story with us? Oh, how far back do you want me to go? <laughs> <laughs> um, I know. So I know you always like to start at that moment that mm -hmm. you were sitting um, in the gym, staring at the mirror, but I would like to jump a little bit forward before that to, to what led you to that moment. Okay. Oh, there's so much, right? I think a lot of things. I, I don't think there's ever one specific thing that leads us to a moment. I think it's a lot of little things along the line. Um, I, I share a lot about um, my, my middle daughter. <laughs> and I feel like that was, um, that was probably, I call it a lot of uncovering for me because she had been so sick 
as as a baby and it made me go places that I I didn't necessarily want to go but I look back on it now and I feel like it was good because it it shone light on places that maybe I was hiding from a little bit so when she was um little she she got really sick and she wasn't thriving so we you know we went through that whole ordeal of um trying to figure out what was going on and I was pretty you know when you when I think I don't know if this is a relatable thing with parents that have a kid that is sick but you kind of get angry first you know like why is this why why you know I had a little boy he was two and he was healthy and you know and then this poor little thing and I was like I you feel kind of helpless and hopeless when you go through stuff like that and when we we got air ambulance to Edmonton and I spent 42 days laying on a bed beside her crib and I think that was I call it kind of uncovering because I I went I withdrew from everyone because it's just what I did and and it, it's a habit that I recognize that I do I do instead of embracing people and letting people in 42 days is a long time to be sitting beside a bed and getting your kid weighed every morning and being told, yep, yeah, she lost some weight and she went septic once and things that I didn't even understand at the time. And it resonates with me in what I do now because I believe people need hope. Mm -hmm. And I journaled every day and I remember the day that I journaled to God because I was like, lost and alone and I was like I need some faith and I need some hope not that that day you know everything lit up and it was all good from that moment but it's when I train and I work with people it's when I always say the kettlebells more than the kettlebell program it's about finding hope you know hope within yourself because it's the big picture and I, I believe in it because I've walked the path of that and that was, I think, <laughs> as not so much fun as it was, it was a, I, I'm going to say it, it was a good moment because it, mm -hmm. it brought me here and I never change anything in the past because, you know, if you learn from it, you can grow from it. And I say mm -hmm. that specifically because you need to learn from it. You can have stuff in the past that goes on, but if you don't take the moment to recognize and understand and learn from it, I feel like it can kind of bury you. <laughs> and, and I say that because when you talk about um, my stories and about how I'm able to get back up is because honestly, I, I pulled that book out. I pulled it out two days ago and I sat with it because I look at it just as a reminder to go, okay, you can do things. And because I feel like there's such a, I have such a zest for life because I'm here. You know, we're here, like, that's a great thing. And I just think, you know, that, that whole part and when I, you know, that building up into, you know, the story in the gym where, you know, I sat and I faced myself. And I always say that I, I used to, when I used to write about that all the time, I used to write that I felt broken and I look back out of it and I, I've changed that and I feel like it was the moment I actually got brave because when we talk about being broken down, I feel like we feel like that, but in a, if we change the terminology and what we think the definition of broken and think of it instead of broken down, like sad and destroyed, it's like you break away from what you're holding on to, and you finally take that step forward. Mm. And I, I think it kind of comes back to that awareness key. And we, like I spend a lot of time with my crew right now, we talk about becoming aware of where you stand and not beating yourself up about it because you, what, what's the point of beating yourself up about it? Because you're there and if it's crappy, <laughs> like it's already crappy, so let's not make it worse and let's just figure out how to move forward and move through it. I do think that that um, time with my middle daughter, it shifted a lot of things within me too because I, I recognize things 
how I did feel alone and how maybe I wasn't as happy within my, my marriage as I thought I was. Because when you go through things, I feel like it uncovers areas that are weak. And again, your awareness is how do you, how do you build on that to make that stronger or grow on it? Mm. Where did that mindset come from, though? The, I, I've, I've become aware of a weakness, and so now I need to build and make that stronger because I feel right now in this in the way society is where when people have their weaknesses exposed we just try to hide from them but for you it became like okay this is an area that needs to be addressed and i'm gonna fix it trainings helped me that way so much because because i parallel my kids will laugh at me because i parallel everything from training to life when you're not strong, you work on it. The same with is, is in a mental weakness or a mindset. So um, I do the Sally up. You do know that challenge. Bring Sally up. Brings the push up mm -hmm. challenge. So I do that every two months now, and I just started doing that over like I started in December. I've done it before, but not as often because I do it because I want to not necessarily. It'll tax my body, but it taxes my brain because I feel like we need to practice our mindset equally as much as we practice our physical training mm. Be because, and it's kind of, you know, when you, we do challenges, I do challenges with my group all the time and um, I love them and they're lots of fun. The problem with the challenge is though, if you're not training the mindset of it, or if you have a goal with your fitness, if you're not training a mindset with it, you're going to fall off because you just will. But if you practice how to train your mindset with it, you can stay consistent with it because you're looking at all parts of yourself. Mm -hmm. how, how does inner dialogue, like the things you're saying to yourself, how does that matter um, when you're going through the struggle, right? So there's, there's times when um, in your book where you talk about you were just laying on the floor, staring at the ceiling, or maybe you were you were going on a date with your wine glass Corvell. Um, <laughs> and, and like, what is the inner dialogue? What are the things that you're saying to yourself to either, is it, is it positive, is it negative? Are you just trying to survive? What's going on through, through the actual struggle phase? Yeah, um, yeah, there's some pretty nasty moments I had to do a lot of work because my inner dialogue, but thankfully I recognize that because sometimes you don't. And mm -hmm. when I was in it, I don't think I necessarily did. That's why I think like the people you're around is so important. You know, the, the lying on the floor, looking at the ceiling. I, you say that and I'm back on the floor in my basement, staring up the ceiling like that. I know exactly how I felt in the moment. I remember the phone call I got from my cousin. Uh, he was going through divorce too. And I just, it's so important to have people around you that you can be real with. You can have 50 people in the room with you. If you can't be real with one of them, you're in trouble. So if you have one person, you need one person. That's all you need. And for me, it was him. It was like, I'm just laying here. I know my kids are at school because they're on their week. I think they were on their week that they were with me. And, oh, just the empty feeling of looking up at the ceiling. There wasn't anything really to look at. It was just a stickle ceiling. <laughs> and I'm just feeling, laying there, feeling empty. And to, there was, I don't even know if there was an internal dialogue other than I just felt empty and alone. And him calling me, universe, God, whatever, putting him in my moment that day. And he, and I, he, all he said was, that's okay. Just get back up. That one saying gave me permission. I felt it gave me permission to be in a really crappy place. And I will tell anyone that I meet 
if they are in a crappy place and they need me to sit with them, hold space, I will, because I was in that spot. And that's what he did for me. He didn't try to fix me. He didn't try to cheer me up. He just let me sit in that space, but he reminded me to get back up. And I could process that in my internal dialogue of, okay, I'm okay. Like, I'm not good right now, but that's okay. And as long as I get up, I'll be okay. And your internal dialogue is, I remember like just things with even business when I was getting started saying some really nasty things to myself. Like, (laughs) like I would be walking down the street and I would have messed something up and I'd be like, man, Jody, that is stupid. Why do you be so stupid about that? But I started catching myself. And I remember that day because I actually did. I caught myself and I was like, no, you're not stupid. You're learning. How would you know what you don't know? And I always share that too with people. I'm like, there are things that when I went through divorce with my kids and I messed things up because, and I, but you don't know until you know, right? Mm -hmm. And that's again, becoming aware, acknowledging and not beating yourself up and then taking the step forward, you know? And I, um, we talk about regrets and stuff like that. And I, I am. When I got my dog, because I talk about my dog, my kid always wanted a dog. Like my son, he wanted a dog when we, like, they wanted a dog so bad every time when, when I was married and we'd have, I'd have a couple glasses of wine and they'd be like, mom, can we have a dog now? <laughs> right? <laughs> and I was like, you just had to wait till I'm weak. And then anyways, <laughs> when, when we went through divorce, my kid wanted a dog and he wanted a pet so bad. And I was just like, oh God, there was so much going on in my world. And I didn't. And then I got my dog and then she weaved her way into my heart that I had blocked off from so much stuff. And I realized how much healing that she gave me and going back to, you know, acknowledging something that had happened. And I acknowledge the fact that my son wanted that. Mm. So we went out for McDonald's one day for lunch. <laughs> I sat across the table from him and I said, I got to tell you something. And he's like, oh gosh, what now? <laughs> he's freaking out. And I told him, I said, I'm so sorry. I didn't let you get a pet. Like I, I took that part of healing away from you. And I acknowledge that. And I apologize for that because I didn't know. And that's how at the end of, you know, I move forward and I don't let that weight hold me down. The, the story about Corval was a dark time that I wasn't even really aware. Because I don't think sometimes we're aware we're in it. So for anybody who doesn't know Corval, I, I named a wine glass and it was a large <laughs> wine glass. <laughs> After, like I named my wine glass Corval because in, in joking, we are like, well, Corval is always going to show up. Corval is never going to hurt me. But Corval did hurt me because it sent me in a spiral, right? You know, you have a few drinks, you felt better. And then the next day was tenfold worse. Like, I always used to say they were the drinking blues. You have a few drinks to kind of numb what was hurting. And they hit you hard. So... Internal dialogue there took me some time to sort through that where I was like, I have the conversation in my head. Is this really worth it? Like you feel good for a little while, but the next day it's like everything is heightened. So the interesting thing about that is I was getting ready to do a shoot. My first shoot I ever did uh, uh, for kettlebell. And I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to see if I, if I, what my body would look like in four weeks if I cut like drinking. And I've always like with my training, feel like I've looked pretty good picture wise to um, train, but I was so like, for me, it was a nice, it was right timing. Cause I also looked at those pictures and I thought, Hmm, maybe there was quite a bit of change. And it was the thing where, also that internal dialogue of, I don't like how I feel the next day. And 
I just want to be healthy. Mm. And mindset, not only like physically healthy, but I wanted to be healthy here. Because when I'm healthy here, I can look at problems and challenges and find solutions for them. Yeah, and there, there's there's so much there that I want to comment on <laughs> because to to go back to the dog story when you when you finally realize because in in the book you explain like you got a dog but you didn't want the dog because you were <laughs> struggling with like love and commitment and a few different things at the time uh, coming off the divorce and some relationship stuff and then there's there's a line in the book where you mention you're out walking the dog and you, you looked at her and you're like, you little shit. I fell in (laughs) love with you. (laughs) And it just, I I could, I could relate to that so much because just my journey with my dog and different things like that as a dog owner, you're like, Oh, I get that. But then to go back even a little bit more, you talk about playing on the floor, sitting in just that numbness, but then you get this call from your cousin. He says, it's okay. Just don't stay there. Right. Or get back up. Um, and then you go on eventually to talk about how you, you now and kind of, you almost encourage people to sit in your pain for a bit. And I think the way you put it in the book is sit in your pain, but set a timer. Yeah. We tend to just avoid pain constantly. What is so important about sitting in your pain and understanding it? It's okay to have pain. I think, and that's what I think that we don't want that, but we learn from it. We grow from it. And I used to, and I still do, I tell my kids when they send a little call and they'll be going through stuff and they're sad or something. And I'm like, that's okay. You will feel like you feel right now, set your timer. And we used to do it. I used to remember when we were under the same roof, we'd, it would be like that five minutes. Feel all of it because you need to feel all of it. Because if you don't feel it, you don't, you can't process it. Mm. And if you don't process it, you can't learn from it. Right. The timer is so that you don't stay there. And that's what I also learned from lying on the floor. You know, don't stay there. It's important to be there, but you have to get up. So that's where the timer came in. And also in my studio that I had back in Regina, I had mirrors and I remember clients saying to me, they left the class and I knew when they left, they weren't happy Hmm. because I've been pretty good at picking up energy and how somebody's, you know, feeling, even when they try to avoid sharing how they're feeling, I'm like, yeah, I get some good energy vibes right now. So I messaged that person and I said, are you okay? And the reply back was, do you want me to be honest? And I said, yep. I said, I wouldn't have asked if I didn't want to be honest. And that person said, well, I'm in terrible shape. I don't know. I don't like how I look. And I had to look at myself in the mirror and for the entire 45 minutes, live it. Mm. (laughs) And, and I don't devalue that. I embrace it because that is how that person felt. And what a terrible feeling. But I sent this back saying, I understand, doesn't feel good not to a feel good and doesn't feel good to look at your reflection, not like what's staring back at you. But I will challenge you to work on that, to fix that. Mm. Because you have two choices in that moment, right? I hated the experience. I'm never going to do it. I don't need to work on it. Or you can look at yourself and you can own where you stand. You don't have to beat yourself up, but you can go, okay, how can I make things feel better, look better? And it comes back down to that. When I train with people and it's hard, I always say, remember this. I want you to remember how crappy you felt the first time you walked in. That is a feeling I don't ever really want you to, that leaves you. Because if you have this here, then you're like, I don't want to visit that place. I don't want to be there ever again. 
and it motivates you internally yourself to keep you on track. We all, you know, up and down. It's, it's a real thing, but I tell you, I feel like you'll have less down if you, you process, sit in it, and then figure out how to work through it. What you just said is so powerful. And I, I can't agree with more because I think we, in this life we live today, in today's society, we've gotten very comfortable. Um, we were talking earlier about internet and cell phones and houses, big houses, and how life is very comfortable. Yet we seem, it seems to us that we, we're, we're falling apart more than ever, our relationships our uh, anxieties through the roof. Um, we have all these different things, but we've tried to make life so easy, so easy mm -hmm. that even comfortable now is difficult, right? And right? When, when, I, when I think back on like my, my great grandma and she's living in Chicago, um, she has a very ill husband, she's got two kids, she's broke, they have nowhere to live. And she hobos it, throws a family on a train to Phoenix, Arizona <laughs> and in, in, in the middle of summer and has to find a job, a place to live, all this stuff to take care of this family. Like that is difficult. That is right? that is a hard life. We don't we don't have to deal with that. Like and if what if we don't recognize where we're at and take time to, to understand that we, we've contributed to some of this and that it's mm -hmm. in our control to change it, we'll never have the motivation to change it. Right. What I would love to do is go back to that moment where you talk about um, you're sitting in the gym, staring in the mirror, and you realized everything had to change. What what were the thoughts? What was going through your head when you were looking at yourself in the mirror that day? Oh, yeah, that's one of those moments, too. You take me back in a flash. <laughs> uh, so I can take you back and I can tell you pretty much how the moment felt. Um, it was, I call it a disconnect, but a, di but a connect. Because mm. I looked at myself, my reflection. My disconnect in my brain was... She looks so strong. And I'm looking around at the equipment thinking, holy shit, I can't lift anything in this room. And that was the disconnect because I've worked out so much, trained so much, and I'm sitting on this bench and standing up felt heavy for me and the connect for me in that moment was number one I'm like I had to get out of that space I feel like couldn't really breathe my internal dialogue is run right because you first have that moment of freeze the freeze was the moment of what's going on and then the flea probably was, I got to get out of here, this space, because I don't really know what's going on other than something's not right. And I grabbed my bag. I went, went for a walk. I remember exactly where I walked to. I remember the bridge I stood at. And I remember the bridge that I cried at. And I thought, I knew something had to change. My hardest part in my internal dialogue was my decision was going to affect four other people. Mm. And as a single person walking through life, making changes and choices, when you do that as an individual, you do it as an individual. But that day I stood on the bridge and I was like, my internal dialogue was everywhere because I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like, it's not working for me. Am I worth disrupting four other people's lives? Like, am I, I stood there and I thought, am I worth it? Like, that was the biggest moment, the biggest question. Is my life worth 
going to a better place where I think will be better for me above the four people I loved. Because when I left my marriage, it wasn't that I didn't love my partner at the time. I just knew that I wasn't the one for him anymore. And I think when I went through the whole nasty divorce, I think probably that was my biggest challenge there too was I remember hugging him in the, on the main floor one day and I knew he loved me so much. And I hugged him knowing I didn't feel that way back. And I felt like you deserve someone that can reciprocate that. So when it got nasty, I was like, man, I was like, I didn't want to make things harder for everyone, but I had to, in that moment, that day that I decided what I was going to do, I, I decided that I was worth it. And I decided that I could guide my children differently. I knew it. I didn't know how exactly how hard it was. And I think I write in the book, I'm happy I didn't know. Because I think sometimes you're better to just go, I want to go there. I'm not sure how I'm going to get there. And I think I do a lot of that with my business too. And I, my goals, I'm like, I want to be there. I'm not sure how I'm going to get, it's probably going to be <laughs> like this. I might end up over here. But that was the kind of the internal dialogue of my day. Um, it was never a, it was never a split decision. Like, I woke up one morning and <laughs> my kids are like, you just woke up one day and decided. I'm like, man, I wish things was that were that easy, <laughs> right? But um, again, having to change how you think. And I actually did today's um, Instagram. I did our, my Instagram today after I got your email last night. I sat and I worked on it. I worked on it this morning. And about it is a self-love thing a belonging to yourself and understanding that you're worth it. And I'm the biggest fan advocate for finding someone else, a partner to share that with. I think you are going to benefit your, your marriage, your partner. When you come to the table, you don't have to be perfect, but when you come to the table with that feeling of self-love for yourself, and I think when I started my journey with my marriage, I didn't have that yet. Mm -hmm. So when I didn't have it, I was about pleasing everybody else. So until I realized one day, I'm like, what about this one? <laughs> right? Where you kind of go, why do I feel like I'm twisted in knots? Like everybody else seems to be doing good. And then I think it, it's just a knowing of yourself that you don't give that away. You can mm. share yourself, but that you, you are capable and you're mm. good. In, in the preface of your book, there's, there's a quote um, where you said, I will no longer walk through life hating myself. And I, I had to look down to remember it, but uh, what, what were you hating about yourself? like for the longest time, everything. Like when I went through my divorce, I felt like terrible. Like I felt like, cause I did this to my kids. I like, cause it was such a nasty divorce. I'm like, wow. Well, I like, I went through the period of, I made the decision that I was worth it. Through the journey of it, I started to question if I was worth it. Mm. And then I started understanding and looking through, I, I call it looking through the life as the eyes of a child. If you hang out with me, <laughs> there are moments where you'll probably like go, are you really 49? <laughs> I'll be 49 this month. Because I look outside, I see the mountains and I just smile and they bring me so much joy. And I started looking through life through that lens and started realizing that life is so precious. And I thought, let me stop this. Like, really, do I want to walk through being this negative internal dialogue, beating the crap out of myself? What does that do? 
Like that gives me zero quality of life. And that's why I think I've got so much belief in people and so much hope in them. If you can just like start to let stuff go and really just embrace being here, being able to, this is going to sound really ridiculous, but kind of funny. And I don't know how, but when I shower, I close my eyes and I feel water because I feel like the simplest of things we've forgotten. Like coming back to where you say, you know, about your great grandma doing what she did, right? Like we have gone so much, we've gotten so much more, but I think the more we get, the more we've taken for granted, mm -hmm. right? Like we say we do hard things when I say that was hard, but I'm like, man, when I was 17, I didn't, I didn't walk around going, oh, life is hard. Like, oh my God, like be uncomfortable. Let's get comfortable. Like I didn't have those kind of conversations. <laughs> so when, when I find that sometimes we go down that rabbit hole, my question I always ask is hard compared to what? Mm. Cause I think it's so important to put life into perspective. Tell us about the kettlebell and how that changed things for you. First time I picked up the bell, put it in my hands. It was like I had my lightning strike moment. <laughs> and I will never be able to fully explain it. Uh, I think a lot of people, when they do maybe some physical activity or something, they have a similar experience. But I felt grounded and mm. I felt like I had a knowing. I can never explain what that is when I sat on the plane to go to New York to first get certified, I was terrified because I didn't do a whole lot of travel by myself. And people were like, you are losing it. <laughs> I'm like, maybe I am losing it a little, but that's all right. I'm okay with it. But again, I sat on that plane with a knowing and the knowing I felt was in the pit of my stomach and maybe it was an instinct, a knowing, knowing, not sure where I was gonna go with this kettlebell training but I felt like it was a pull for me. And I didn't necessarily, I remember always thinking when I started, I'm like, I don't really know if it actually has to do with a kettlebell, but it started with the bell and it started with being a train with the bell. I wanted, you know, as I was all, I have a kinesiology degree and I wanted to go back into the fitness industry, but there, the fitness industry is so broad, right? And yeah. I thought, I want to be good at something. Like, I enjoy being good at things <laughs> and focus in on it. So I, I, when I fell in love with the kettlebell, I was like, okay, well, this is, this is something I can, I can just go really niche on. And to this day, I like, it's all I train. You know, when you watch a lot of trainers, they do such a, like a big, um, a lot of conventional, they move conventional training yep. into with the kettlebell and I've gotten so many benefits from kettlebell that I do kettlebell pull-ups and push-ups. And that's pretty much, you know, my training regime. And one summer I actually did jump into, I had someone say, let's do a conventional training program. And I thought, well, I'll always try it just to see it. And man, week two, I'm like, why would I do this? <laughs> like I have my bell in the living room and I can do my workout. I don't have to change plates. I don't have to go back over to this other machine. And I feel good. Right. And I feel strong and everything I did. So I was like, I was actually happy. I, I went back and tried a little bit because it, all it did was reiterate that I can train bells and be good and be happy with it and be happy with my strength, my cardio and uh, my mobility. And it's convenient for me. Mm -hmm. And I carry my backpack with my bell. <laughs> I don't know if that's convenient, but <laughs> Have so, you yeah. have you unpacked that thought you mentioned in in the beginning where you said, I don't know if this is all. I, I think you said I don't know if it's just about the kettlebell. Have you have you dug into that at all? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And I don't, I don't think it. I I'm gonna say I was gonna say I don't think it is, but I know it's not. It's not because it's not how, even the training isn't just like my training has done so much evolution with mindset that when you interact with me, when you work with me, 
the kettlebell is the tool we use. And it allows us to, you know, get stronger physically. But if you really dive deep into the program with me, you'll find that the mindset's there. When I teach my lives, I talk about it all the time. Or the moments where you're like, yeah, do you feel it? Do you feel the minute where you're like, I'm happy I'm here. Happy I showed up. I still have those moments, you know, where it's like, oh gosh, it's 5.30. I've kind of been sitting a lot. I feel like, yuck. And then you're 10 minutes in and you're like, yeah, that's why I'm here. Right? So, yeah, it's not all. It's not about the kettlebell. It's the training tool I use. It's the vehicle I use to drive my program, drive sharing my story. I hope that you fall in love with it as much as I have. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's what, what you mentioned there is so important, and I don't think a lot of people realize it. When you're feeling down and you're sluggish, sloppy, even tired, the last thing you want to go do is move the body. Yeah. But moving the body is healing in so oh. many ways. Yes. And you, you break down some of the science of it, but uh, I think we both can agree that if more people just got out and moved, yes. um, we would have less anxiety issues, uh, less depression, less obesity, less health issues, all just from the medicine of movement. Yeah, right? 100% agree. Yeah. Hardest part is always showing up, right? I always say when my clients, I used to say when you walk through the studio door, that was the hardest thing is walking through the mm. mat work. I would say that now. Hardest thing is push and play, joining me and, you know, and showing up in your, in your home space. But um, I've never had anybody, never, really, I should never say never, but I'm really going to throw out that I'm going to say never had anybody show up and work out and train and go, oh, man, why did I show up? I always tell my clients because I built some of the programs that they're two minutes long. And I because my idea is if you didn't get any movement in today, doesn't matter if you only do two minutes, you get two minutes. And mm -hmm. the idea behind two minutes is just maybe you did two minutes and you're like, hmm, I felt pretty good. I'm going to hit play and do four more, you know, so you snowball it because mm -hmm. movement is healing. Movement is medicine. You're so correct. So as I was preparing for this interview and this conversation, I was digging through your Instagram and I had gone back and found a post. I think it was it was like May of 2016, 2017. So oh, quite a bit ago. <laughs> I, I, there, there was a lot going on, but it was so impactful at the time because you were standing on was it was like a target and it was just your feet and you'd taken a photo of it. And there was an arrow pointing at the target that said, you are here. And you had a quote that you put it that you had put with the, the photo that said, you are here. Um, you are not where you are. Sorry, it said you are not where you were yesterday or three years ago. You are here. Make the best of today and be brilliant. And when you read your story, you know there was a lot going on at that time frame. And now we are seven years removed. <laughs> where is Jody now? Oh, that's it. I think this question was like... Hmm. It's been crazy where I am now. I have practiced getting up again and again. You read the story, you'll, you'll find that out fast. Um, the last six months have been crazy for me because I've closed a studio and picked up, closed, moved my stuff to storage, move my, my precious dog is at my parents right now. The road I have built myself allowed me to be brave, to jump again. Terrifying, but more terrifying was not jumping. Hmm. 100%. Like if we talk about that question where I say, I always ask myself, will you regret this? If you don't do it, 
So my road from that post from 2017 or 16 has allowed me the courage to move forward, to grow physically and be in a completely different space. I've always been online, but to go, you know, fully online, move cities. And yeah, so my road has planted me here. It's exciting and terrifying all at once, but it's good. I feel it feels when you know, when you land somewhere, and again, maybe it's that knowing that feeling where you're right, where you're supposed to be, even if it's uncomfortable, like, for example, this weekend is Mother's Day weekend. This is the first Mother's Day, and I'm going to try not to cry. <laughs> but I have never not been with my mom or with my kids. But my road here has taught me that I'm okay. And just because I'm not in that space, that I'm still very loved and I can give love. And my journey has taught me that. And my journey has also taught me that if I'm not challenging myself, I'm not growing. And I will not risk not growing because we get this one shot to do this epic life and my, my goal, my dream is to be able to connect with as many people as I can, share my story, to inspire them to, number one, move, but mostly inspire them to live. Because we have, I think we've gotten mixed up on what living is. Living isn't having the big fancy house, yes, do I want a big fancy house maybe one day? Maybe, but I want to live. I want to see things. I want to travel. I want to be able to meet you and let you tell me the story about your grandpa and your grandma. That's what I want. I want to connect. And yeah, so that's where that little target has put me today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. If you were to take everything in your book, everything we've talked about and put it into, this is the one thing I want people to take away from my story, my journey, what we've talked about today, what would that be? Oh man, the book didn't look that long, but you asked me to sum <laughs> that up. <laughs> um, it's a great question. I come, I feel like movement and living are things that you should think about. I think they need to be together because I think there's so much greatness when you put the two of them together. And I feel like if you're going to figure it out, I feel like if you use awareness, acknowledgement and action, those three, three, those three things along with you know, your movement and your, you know, just living, it'll allow you to take those steps to go the next step. Mm. Does that make any sense? Yes. <laughs> Sometimes things make sense in my brain and then I'm like, oh yeah, that didn't make any sense. <laughs> no, it did. And, and so what, what, what I'm gathering from that is, uh, especially knowing the context of, of reading your, having the context of reading your book, is that m one of the big saviors in your life, and I, I, I'm, I don't mean like the, the thing that changed everything, but one of the, the rocks, the foundations of your transformation was movement. Yes. I, I can't agree more with that answer. I know my transformation from leaving my job being in uh, and, and starting this journey of building the life edge and everything we did actually started with movement as well. Uh, I was overweight, I was unhealthy. And I knew that in order to make any kind of transformation, I had to get this physical thing under control. Um, and that's where I developed my discipline, my mindset, all the things that we've come through or talked about today. 
um, came from starting with movement. And so I can 100% relate to that. It's self, right? Because when you start to move your body, you're starting to take care of yourself, mm. right? Physically, when you start to physically take care of yourself. And because I, I believe that that moment was me, I like physically, I was good at showing up to take care of myself physically, but my physical self allowed me to look at my internal self and start to heal and do that. Cause you, and then just because we come back to you saying, um, he, movement is healing. It's medicine, right? We, we don't, we talk about movement all the time and, but I don't like, do we really, really talk about it? Like we talk about it from the science part, you know, it's, you know, so you can lose weight and all this, but once you start to get that, if you start to get into the inner self and start working on that, then I think that that that's where you have the biggest shift. And again, going back to the challenges, it's fun for people to do the challenge, but I think your biggest challenge within that challenge is to find ways to tap into you're starting to feel better. Now let's look at some of the stuff that you don't feel better about. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean feel better is in movement, climbing stairs. You know, I mean, what when you look in the mirror and you look at your reflection, what do you need to work on internally in your mind, in your heart? Mm. That reminds me of the, uh, the story you tell in your book about the, it was a 21 day challenge or a 30 day challenge you were doing with the, the Navy SEAL guy and you had to restart it because a doctor had told you something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And for me, from my perspective, when I read through that story and his response was, well, no, it sounded like you just gave up because somebody else said so. And, and that's, that's not, that's not what he said. That's, that's how I read it. Yeah. Um, and what I was hearing from him in that time, and you, you can give me your perspective on this. What I was hearing from him was this is another moment of weakness that you need to work on because you caved, you caved when the going got tough instead of looking for a solution. Yes, yes. I love that moment and I love that story for a few reasons. Um, number one, because it taught me perspective because I stood back and I went, I understood where he was coming from. Like he served, he, and he told me once, he goes, if I, if I break my back, I still have to carry my soldier across that field. If a doctor told me I can't carry him because my back's broken, well, guess what? I'm carrying him. So I appreciated, and I could look at it from that perspective from him, because that's what's how he perceives. What I've learned in my journey is just because I have a perspective, I can't enforce it on you, and I have to understand that you have a perspective. When people read my book, everybody's going to perceive it differently. I can't, I can't change that because there's life experiences. Well, you know, you and me could read the same sentence and we're going to think of it differently because mm. of how we perceived life. Right. Um, my perspective in that situation was it was so hard, not, it was so hard failing for me. And because I had two trainers do that challenge with me, I kind of felt too like, oh, frick, like I, I, not only have I let myself down, I let them down. But on the flip side of it, when I had that doctor's appointment, she knew how busy I was. She knew I'd be on the mats and probably teaching in 24 to 48 hours because <laughs> it's who I am. And I respected her and I respected her um, knowledge and I respected my body to go if she's telling me, cause she knows how, she knows how determined and disciplined I am. But if she's really telling me, Jody, you're not to finish today, you're going to go home and be okay with lying on the couch with a hot water bottle <laughs> and just, you know, not feeling great. So it was hard for me, but again, I looked at that as such a huge, huge lesson because at the same time I did choose what I felt was best for me in that time. Part of my mindset, you know, was like, 
oh man, he's probably right. I probably could have did three there, four there. But I do remember my girls coming over that day and I sent them home because I said, you know, it's, I don't, I don't feel good. And I remember thinking, yeah, it's, it is okay to be, just let things heal too. And so. We're all working at different levels or, or we're all working on ourselves at, and we're all at different levels, right? We're, we're yes. growing at, at, at different rates. Um, and some people may be focused more on the physical side of their life or, maybe the financial side of their life or even the emotional and mindset side of life. As, as we grow, sometimes we grow closer to, together. We, we, we grow apart. Um, but you said in, in your book, friendships are like seasons. And if you grow, not everyone will grow with you. And that hit me because I've had relationships, friends that I've outgrown and it's, it's a bummer mm -hmm. and it's not out of malice. How are you dealing with that, that concept today? How does that impact who you are today? How has that affected your personal growth um, in any way? Yeah, I think um, it's a hard one. But what I've learned, and it's still, there's days, like you say too, like it's, it kind of, like it really sucks because, mm. you know, you had this friendship, but then all of a sudden it's non-existent. But I think I have learned the process of letting go. We hang on to so much stuff because I feel we hang on to it because we think if we let go of it, it doesn't mean as much. Mm. I sit with that and I talk about it and I work through that myself um, because I've seen so many people carrying such a heavy weight and I've done it too, where you, you have a relationship that you really valued and you thought it was something grandiose, like big. And you're like, how come it just, just disappeared? And that's why I was talked about the seasons because I don't think they it means that they have to be of lesser value to you. And then I think that they can, those friendships can hold a certain place, a certain spot. But I think by just letting it go, you, you better yourself in carrying stuff all the time. Because if you carry the friendships that didn't work and you always sit there and you're kind of like, oh man, what did I do wrong? What did it, what, what, what went wrong? And then it's just like this banter, this internal dialogue, right? That you have instead of going, it, you know, you learned from it. You had an experience together. You got to share time together, which is pretty great and look at it that way. And I think it's just about learning, learning how to like, let go and be okay with it. And letting go doesn't mean, I sometimes think that like, for me anyway, I associate like sayings and terms with, with a feeling. And I think sometimes working through that process of when I say let go doesn't mean sad and it's floating down the river and I'm never gonna see it again, <laughs> right? So it's something I do, it's like I practice, you know, letting go is just like, it's not letting it disappear. It's just not letting it have be heavy anymore. I, th I think that's been one of the hardest things I've had to work through in my own growth and in my own entrepreneurial journey is knowing that I don't have time for to dedicate to the relationships that I was before. And as they've some of them have faded away, it's being okay with it and knowing that for that season, it meant mm -hmm. something, but just because it doesn't exist anymore, doesn't mean that it didn't have value. Yes. And, that. and, and that's been something that's been difficult to address in, in some ways. Uh, but, but I, I'm getting better at it. And the, the reason I brought that up was because you, that was part of your entrepreneurial journey. Um, or at least as you were, alluding to it in the book. Where are you now with, with Kettlebell Stronger? Where are you now in your entrepreneurial journey and what do you have going on? Yeah, so I am living online. 
and it's been it's been really good we've started some challenges this month so um the online space is great because like i said i can build little pieces of shorter workouts that people can go on and access um i do my lives where you know we chat before or after i feel like the lives interest or they're interesting to me because sometimes people don't join in on them that they like to do the lives versus the exclusive mm -hmm. probably because i'm a little bit more ridiculous in a live <laughs> than i am in an exclusive up because i'm usually like okay this this so there's that factor that i think is probably you know there and i get i talk more directly to i get to um do shout outs i always think about that show I, do you remember that show? I don't know, you might be too young, where the lady had the mirror and she would say, I see, what was it, Romper Room? Do you ever remember Romper uh, Room? No, I never saw Romper Room. <laughs> yes, so I'm just aged myself. <laughs> but it allows me that space where I can, you know, do a shout outs to who's training. And um, I still have my cert certification programs. So I train the trainer to train the program. Mm -hmm. My Phoenix transformation, which I built when I was in Arizona because it allows me that constant connection with my clients working through the physical and the mindset set and the other space that I'm still living in and growing in is our retreats and I'm working on a Costa Rica retreat for November. Mm -hmm. You should come. <laughs> Costa Rica does sound beautiful. <laughs> it is beautiful. It's magical. So if you ever watched the documentary, The Blue Zone on Netflix, okay, check it out. I have not. And it, The Blue Zone is, I'm not going to do it justice, but it's a um, documentary saying that it's the blue zones on the earth where people live the longest. Hmm. And Interesting. the place where I was at wasn't far from there. So I was like, I'm always walking around going, there's some energy here. It must be the blue zone. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm coming back. I'm going back. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, Jody, I do know that you have a free gift for all of our listeners. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I love this because it's kind of what I talk about, the snowball effect of just starting to stack your habits. Because sometimes we feel like we have to jump in. When we jump in, we jump into this big pool of water and it's like, we kind of start to paddle frantically. So uh, I wanted to share some recipes because we know that fueling our body is also super important. So uh, yeah, go to the website and you can sign up and you'll get five recipes and you'll get also the idea why and how to lay out those recipes so you're not changing everything at once, not feeling overwhelmed, taking baby steps, kind of like when I say do push-ups during the day, you don't have to do them all at once. Just do a couple here and there. Get those small little bits of movement. But the recipes, they're, they're actually, they're, I'm like, they're actually really good. <laughs> you know, sometimes recipes, when people say recipes are healthy, they're like, oh, no, they're really good. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you for that. And for everyone listening, the book that we are talking about is Jody's book, I Don't Do Vanilla. If you want to check it out, it's on Amazon. It's a great way to dive deeper into her story. And Jody, I must say, just thank you for being vulnerable with us today and sharing your story. And I didn't want to, to take you and, and back into some of those moments and those feelings, but when you read your story and understand what you've gone through, your mindset and your inner dialogue and where you are today was just so powerful that I felt that it, it, it just, we needed to, to share it with the world. And so thank you for that. And where can the listeners go if they want to connect with you, sign up for your training or learn, learn more about you? First of all, Chris, thank you so much. And thank you for switching that up on us last night about what we were going into, because I think it's super important, the mindset, the movement, all of it together. Uh, where can you find me? Uh, kbstronger.com. I'm on pretty much every social media platform I can think of. <laughs> Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok. That's kind of crazy. So I don't know. <laughs> Probably stick to the other ones. <laughs> but um, yeah, and just reach out, connect. Honestly, send me a, send me a direct message and I will, I would love to connect with you. Mm -hmm. 
And I will make sure to include links to all of those um, down below in the show notes. I'll even throw in the Amazon link for the book so you can go check out the book. It's a short read. It's very impactful. I highly recommend it. Jody, thank you for being here today. And if you enjoyed this episode, uh, be sure to like, subscribe. And if you're listening on audio, please rate and review and share this with your friends so that we can help um, share Jody's story, but also continue to get amazing guests on here like Jody. So Jody, thank you again for your time today. Thank you so much for having me.